Okay, let's take a look at these questions. Number one, the guy likes the book because its leaves were yellow. What does this say about him? Let's take a look. Here, okay, so uh, he's describing, the first paragraph is describing his neighborhood. The second paragraph is describing his house. Uh, the waste room behind the kitchen was littered with old useless papers. Among these, well, actually, no, we should mention the former tenant of our house was a priest who had died in the back drawing room. A drawing room is kind of like a living room. It's where you would meet guests. Uh, and this house has two of them, and he died in the back one. Uh, air musty from having been long enclosed hung in all the rooms, so the air was not very circulating very well. And the waste room behind the kitchen was littered with old useless papers. Among these, I found a few paper covered books. So this tells us that the books were cheap editions. They are soft cover. They are paperbacks. They're not hard cover. Right? They're paper covered. The pages of which were curled and damp. The Abbot by Walter Scott, which is a famous historical thriller novel. The Devout Communicant uh, is, I guess, a religious book. And the Memoirs of Vidoc. The footnote at the bottom tells us that Vidoc. Actually, let's look at the footnote. François Eugène uh, Vidoc had an extraordinary career as soldier, thief, chief of the French detective force, and private detective. So the guy was a very interesting police officer. He had many interesting adventures. Uh, his memoirs or his, his uh, memories of his life are probably filled with stories about crime and adventure and great success. But the narrator says, I liked the last best because its leaves were yellow. So he doesn't mention the story. He doesn't mention the content. He likes it because it looks old. And he, he likes the whole room because it looks old, right? It's been closed and shut up for a long time. It's filled with old useless papers. The, the person who used to live here was a priest. Um, this is Ireland, so it's a Catholic priest, Tian Zhu Jiao Shen Fu. And Catholicism is very focused on tradition and ritual um, and history. So all of these things are things that the main character loves. Uh, rather than the adventure story that we might expect a young boy to be interested in, he seems to care more about the feeling of being old, the feeling of having a history, of having a tradition. Of course, he doesn't know. He's only 12. He probably doesn't really understand uh, what these books are talking about. But he likes the feeling. So now that we better understand this character, we also have a better idea of why he does what he does in this story. So we know that he has a crush on Mengen's sister. Or if Mengen's sister came out on the doorstep to call her brother into his tea, we watched her from our shadow peer up and down the street. Peer means to look. We waited to see whether she would remain to or go in. And if she remained, we left our shadow and walked up to Mengen's steps resignedly. So if she doesn't give up trying to call them home, they will finally go home. OK, so up to now, this is normal, right? An older sister taking care of her younger brother and her brother's friends. But the next sentence changes the, the feeling about this character. She was waiting for us. Her figure defined by the light from the half open door. 
how does the narrator look at this young lady? She's not just somebody's older sister. He notices her figure, the shape of her body. It's defined by the light. So like you can imagine, right? It's after sunset, she goes out, stands outside of the door calling for her younger brother and his friends. So the light is coming from behind her body. And so it says that the light defines her shape. It, it shows you the shape of her body. So from this sentence, we start to get the idea that maybe our main character is kind of in love with her. He notices her very carefully. If we skip a sentence, her dress swung as she moved her body and the soft rope of her hair tossed from side to side. Yeah, no, he's deeply in love. Uh, and the next paragraph confirms this. Every morning I lay on the floor in the front parlor watching her door. A parlor is also kind of like a living room. Uh, here it's in the front of the house. The blind was pulled down to within an inch of the sash, so the window is closed almost entirely. He can only see a little bit through the window. So that I could not be seen, so he's hiding himself. When she came out on the doorstep, my heart leaped. I ran to the hall, seized my books and followed her. So now he's stalking her. I kept her brown figure always in my eye, and when we came near the point at which our ways diverged, so he, she goes this way, I go that way, I quickened my pace and passed her. This happened morning after morning. And the next sentence is also very important. I had never spoken to her except for a few casual words, and yet her name was like a summons to all my foolish blood. So he has a crush on her, even though he has never spoken to her. He probably doesn't know what kind of person she is. He doesn't know what she cares about. Just like his attitude toward the book, he goes by feeling, not by what's inside. Uh, and so like the next few paragraphs are all about how much he loves her, how uh, he's always thinking about her. And then notice this. Her name sprang to my lips at moments in strange prayers and praises, which I myself did not understand. So he knows he has the feeling. He doesn't really know why because he's too young, but he describes this feeling using religious language, prayer praise my eyes were often full of tears so he, now he's not just in love with her he's treating her like a, a religious person like me with taylor swift uh and then uh the next paragraph things get kind of crazy uh let's see where is it All my senses seemed to desire to veil themselves and feeling that I was about to slip from them. So he's about to faint with his love for her. I pressed the palms of my hands together until they trembled, murmuring, oh, love, oh, love many times. So like really he's like worshiping her. Praying to her. At last she spoke to me. And then. When she addressed the first words to me, I was so confused that I did not know what to answer. She asked me, was I going to Araby? I forgot whether I answered yes or no. It would be a splendid bazaar, she said. She would love to go. A bazaar is a traveling market. And why can't you, I asked. While she spoke, she turned a silver bracelet round and round her wrist. She could not go, she said, because there would be a retreat that week in her convent. So in those days, Ireland, well, Ireland is still deeply Catholic, 
But in those days, Ireland was so Catholic that often the education system would use religious schools. So it mentions a convent, which is a place for nuns, Shonu, not because she's a nun, but because she's a student there. A retreat is like a field trip, except instead of going out, you go somewhere else to like pray and meditate uh, for a long time. So she can't go because basically there's something going on at school. Uh, and at this point, we get a description of some other people doing some other things. Then we get a description of her. And the light from the lamp opposite our door caught the white curve of her neck, lit up her hair that rested there and falling, the light falling, lit up the hand upon the railing. It fell over one side of her dress and caught the white border of a petticoat, tsunqing, just visible as she stood at ease. Ah, Joyce is such a great writer, because look at this, look at this. Finally, she speaks to him. He's so surprised he doesn't catch the meaning. He forgot what he said. Uh, but she says something else, and he very, I guess, proud of himself, asks the question, why can't you go? And then, like, in his memory, he's thinking back to what this scene looked like, describing her movements, uh, describing her answer, and then at this point, the conversation is kind of paused, right? He asked the question, she gave an answer. There's a small pause before the next thing. And during this pause, he describes what he sees. He sees a few boys fighting and playing. He sees her, her neck, her hair, her body, her entire person standing at ease. And then finally, uh, because it looks like he's not going to say anything, she says, it's well for you, she said. In Chinese, this would say, this would be something like, 你很好, or, or something like, uh, the idea being, you're so lucky that you can go. And he says, if I go, I will bring you something. Now, I want you to think very carefully about this event. Did she say, please bring me something? No, he himself volunteered to bring her something. Did she say, I wish I could go? Well, she, does, she says, I would love to go, but she doesn't explain why. Right, she waits for him to ask. And then when he doesn't say anything, she doesn't ask him a question. She doesn't really say something to progress the conversation. She simply adds a meaningless sentence. It's well for you. It's like a hint. Oh, you're so lucky you can go. So, and then he, he volunteers to bring something for her. So what do you think is going through her mind in this conversation? Because to me, it seems like she knows that he's in love with her. And he's hoping, or sorry, she's hoping that he will bring something for her, but she doesn't want to ask him. So it seems like this young lady is actually a little bit manipulative. But the story doesn't tell us because the story is from the viewpoint of the young boy and he is head over heels in love. Uh, and of course, his love is based on uh, the beauty of this young woman, not the kind of person that she is. That's why we're talking about this uh, for question one. Question two, what do you think the young lady and the two young gentlemen are talking about? Why is it important to point out their English accents? This was a very popular question today. 
uh, only one or I think only one group really caught the meaning of this um, scene. So let's look at this. So OK, after he says I'll bring you something, he has to wait all week for his uncle to say yes. Uh, finally, his uncle is so drunk that he almost forgets uh, to give him the travel money. When he finally gets to the bazaar, it's almost closed. He can't find the entrance. None of this is good. None of this is a good omen. Those are shongzao, right? It's like a symbolic foreshadowing. It's telling us, the reader, that this story probably will not end very well. Finally, he gets in uh, and he finds a shop. Uh, at the door of the stall, a young lady was talking and laughing with two young gentlemen. I remarked their English accents. Remark here just means noticed. I noticed their English accents and listened vaguely to their conversation. Oh, I never said such a thing. Oh, but you did. Oh, but I didn't. Didn't she say that? Yes, I heard her. Oh, there's a fib. Observing me, the young lady came over and asked me, did I wish to buy anything? The tone of her voice was not encouraging. She seemed to have spoken to me out of a sense of duty. So she's coming over and you can imagine like this annoyed sales lady looking at you and like, what do you want? Do you want to buy anything? I looked and again, this is a young boy. I looked humbly at the great jars that stood like Eastern guards at either side of the dark entrance to the stall. Eastern here means uh, from the Middle East, Zongdong. And murmured, no, no, thank you. The young lady changed the position of one of the vases and went back to the two young men. They began to talk of the same subject. Once or twice, the young lady glanced at me over her shoulder. So not only is she rude to him, when she goes back, she has her back to him. She's facing away from him. And so we we get the feeling, right? Every time she looks back at the young boy, it again reminds him of how annoying he is to her, how much she wants him to go away. And he knows this. I lingered before her stall. Before means in front of. So I, I stayed in front of her stall, though I knew my stay was useless to make my interest in her wares seem the more real. Wares today we would say goods or merchandise or products. So he, he doesn't leave right away, not because he thinks he will be able to buy something, but to save face. He can't leave too fast. Back to this question, what are they talking about? It looks like they're having an argument about whether the young woman said something. But it says here that they're talking and laughing. So it's not a real argument. I think they're flirting. Yeah, I think they're having fun. I think they're flirting. And that's why the young lady does not want to sell him something. She wants to enjoy her time with these two young men. So the second part of the question, why is it important to point out the fact that they have English accents? Well, remember this story is set in Ireland, in Dublin, Ireland. And Ireland was the first British colony. Uh, and it was terribly, terribly abused by the British government. Uh, you've you may have heard about the Irish famine. I think I talked about that when introducing this period. Uh, we talked about this in the 18th century. We were reading the essay by Jonathan Swift called A Modest Proposal about how there are so many poor Irish families and poor Irish children. The best way to solve this problem is to eat them. So that essay was already about how the British and the English misruled and mistreated Ireland. So they have a long, terrible history with each other. So imagine this, right? You go to a market. 
the salesperson is rude to you and they're not even from here. They're from like an enemy country. A country that thinks that they are better than you are. I'm not saying that the saleswoman is racist, but the situation feels a lot worse because she's English and the young boy is Irish. It's like a symbol of their past colonial history. At the very least, we can say that the young woman does not feel so guilty about that colonial history that she feels the need to be extra nice to Irish people. Like, you know, today, if well, not today, before the Russian Ukraine war, if you talk to a German person about war, they will always be very sorry for World War I and World War II and for all of the stuff that the Nazis did. But here, the young woman does not seem to have any of that feeling. To her, he's just another annoying young kid. Uh, and so, of course, uh, the young kid does not buy something. And the ending. Paragraph is also a great paragraph. He leaves the bazaar gazing up into the darkness because it's already nighttime. I saw myself as a creature driven and derided by vanity. Uh, self image, love of self image. And my eyes burned with anguish and anger. So finally, after this humiliation, he finally wakes up to his situation. In love with an older woman who doesn't care about him, only wants to use him. Mistreated or not mistreated, like kind of ignored by his uncle and aunt and mistreated by this English woman who's supposed to try to sell him something. And all because he thinks that he's in love with someone because they are so beautiful. Driven and derided by vanity. Again, Joyce is an incredibly powerful and careful writer. Every word in this story is there for a reason. And if we had time, I would spend a whole hour, maybe two hours talking about this story. But I also asked you to read another story, so we have to keep going. Question three. Why are men who wrote books bad and why are women who wrote books even worse? One group took this question. So this story is set in the Caribbean. Uh, the West Indies, Xiindu Qingdao. And it's about the narrator's friend Eddie and his family was a small, thin boy. So again, it's a story that takes place in childhood. His father, Mr. Sawyer, was a strange man. Nobody could make out what he was doing in our part of the world at all, so he's not from here. He was not a planter, a planter is a farmer, or a doctor, or a lawyer, or a banker. He didn't keep a store. He wasn't a schoolmaster or a government official. So like, what is he doing here? He wasn't, that was the point, a gentleman. So he's not a good man. And he also detested the Caribbean. So he doesn't even like being here. Uh, the next paragraph gives us the answer. He was agent for a small steamship line which in those days linked up Venezuela and Trinidad with the smaller islands. Venezuela, Venezuela, and Trinidad is one of the Caribbean nations. So he works for a travel agency. And then he had chosen to settle in a place he didn't like and to marry a colored woman. So his wife is black. Though a decent, respectable, nicely educated color woman, mind you. So like the racism appears in this, starting from this sentence, right? The 
narrator feels the need to defend his wife, not just a regular local woman or the local black woman. She's decent. She's good. She's educated. Which, of course, implies that most black women there are not good, decent, educated women. When Mr. Sawyer was drunk, this often happened. So again, not happy, right? He drinks a lot. He used to be very rude to her. She never answered him. Look at the black woman showing off, he would say. And she would smile as if she knew she ought to see the joke, but couldn't. You damned long-eyed gloomy half-caste, you don't smell right, he would say. And she never answered, not even to whisper, you don't smell right to me either. Half-caste tells us that she's not entirely black. She somewhere in her family line, there was a white person. So up to this point, we now have a kind of picture of this marriage. White man who hates the place, doesn't want to be here, but his job makes him come here. Marries a black woman, doesn't like her either. And she, of course, does not like being treated this way, but she doesn't feel enough power to fight back. You might be thinking, well, if he doesn't like black women, why did he marry one? Because he was lonely. He was physically lonely. Yeah. OK, so that's the story of the marriage. And then on the next page. So OK, and then finally, um, Mr. Sawyer died suddenly. After he was dead. Uh, the main character and Eddie took possession of his study, the room with all of his books. My room, Eddie called it my books, he would say my books. And then one day Mrs. Sawyer's mouth tied her eyes pleased. She is pulling all the books out of the shelves and piling them into two heaps. The big, fat, glossy ones, the good looking ones, Mildred explains in a whisper, Mildred is the servant, lie in one heap. These include the Encyclopedia Britannica, Dying Bai Ke, British flowers, birds and beasts, various histories, books with maps, fruits, English in the West Indies, and so on. They are going to be sold. The unimportant books with paper covers or damaged covers or torn pages lie in another heap. They are going to be burnt. Yes, burnt. A saldio. So here we get the first idea of what kind of books are here and Mrs. Sawyer's attitude and feelings toward these books. Uh, like the Encyclopedia Britannica, British Flowers, Beasts and Birds, English in the West Indies. These are all books about English culture and British culture. And then later we have another mention, the poetry shelf, poems, Lord Byron, poetical works, Milton, and so on. Christina Rossetti, all of these are famous British writers that we did not have time to read in this class. So all of these books are British, British culture, British knowledge. And Mrs. Sawyer apparently hates them because she's going to burn the ones that she cannot sell. So uh, the first part of the question, why are men who write books bad? Well, in this story, the only books that we're talking about are books by white British authors. So perhaps uh, this line is is uh, by a flicker in Mrs. Sawyer's eyes. I knew that worse than men who wrote books were women who wrote books. So this is the attitude of Mrs. Sawyer. Why would she think that men who write books are bad? Because these the only books that she has seen in her house are these colonial books by white authors. Why would a British person write about uh, English in the West Indies? 
because this knowledge might be useful in governing the West Indies. It's colonial knowledge. It's knowledge to help control the colony. So if she only knows white books, and these books are by white men, and the most in, important white man in her life was abusive and racist to her, then you can kind of see why she would hate these books. They're from the same culture as her husband. They make her think of her husband. And uh, anyone who is interested in this culture, she might think is just like her husband. So of course she wants to sell them and burn them. But then why are women who wrote this kind of book infinitely worse? Why can you shoot the men, but you must torture those women? Well, because she's not just thinking about colonialism and race. He was also her husband. Their relationship was also about a power dynamic related to men and women. So all of the reasons that she hates him would also include the fact that not only is he white, but he's a white man. So to her, the idea of these books is related to the culture of these white men. So if a woman also wrote this kind of book and tried to join that culture, then Mrs. Sawyer probably thinks that this woman is a traitor to women, that she would, that such a woman would believe in and support a culture that treated black women so terribly. Uh, today, we also have a similar saying in English. We say, uh, there's a special place in hell for women who hate women. So that's question three. You know, because like in a, in a, how do I say this? White, hetero, patriarchal, capitalist society, it's white men who have the most social power. So you would think that people with less social power would work together to survive and to get by. But if a white woman who is also has less power than white men works against other women of different races, that is especially evil to Mrs. Sawyer. So question four, why at the end does Eddie cry? Why at the end does the narrator cry? We already saw the first part of this answer, which is Eddie thinks of these books as his books. He's half white. His white father died leaving all these books, and he is a young boy, also a male. So of course he thinks now these are my books. But then his mother starts selling and burning them. Uh, Mrs. Sawyer did not seem to notice that we were there as she was sorting the books, but she was breathing free and easy, and her hands had got the rhythm of tearing and pitching. Pitching means throwing. So you can tell that she's feeling free, right? Her abusive husband has finally died. She can do what she wants with these things. But when Eddie said no, she did not even glance at him. No, he said again in a high voice. Not that one. I was reading that one. She laughed and he rushed at her his eyes starting out of his head. Starting means jumping, so his eyes are really big. Shrieking, now I've got to hate you too. Now I hate you too. So first of all, can we make sense of his behavior? Why does he behave like this? Well, we just mentioned that Mrs. Sawyer has connected these books to her husband. But so has Eddie. Eddie has also connected these books to his father. So burning them and selling them is kind of like 
getting rid of his father a second time. Yeah, their son. Uh, as it says on the first page of the story, a young skinny kid named Eddie, his father, Mr. Sawyer. So, you know, he's feeling some loyalty to his dead father. So the way that he expresses that feeling is, now I've got to hate you too. Just like my father hated you, now I have to as well. He snatched the book out of her hand and gave her a violent push. She fell into the rocking chair. Well, I wasn't going to be left out of all this, so I grabbed the book from the condemned pile, the pile that was going to be burned, and dived under Mildred's outstretched arm. Then we were both in the garden. So notice that the main character grabs a book not because she has any feelings about Mr. or Mrs. Sawyer, but because this is what her friend is doing. So she's showing support for her friend. And they, they get away, they run into the garden. Uh, they talk a bit about what will happen. They talk a bit about race. Um, and when race is brought up, Eddie gets mad. You can go to the devil, Eddie said. She's prettier than your mother. So right again, when he's mad, he starts defending his parent. Now he's defending his mother. Uh, and then they wait until sunset. And as they're as the main character is about to leave, he says, don't go yet, don't go yet. We sat under the mango tree and I was holding his hand when he began to cry. Drops fell on my hand like the water from the dripstone in the filter in our yard. Then I began to cry too. And when I felt my own tears on my hand, I thought, now perhaps we're married. So why are they each crying? I think we can see at this point that Eddie is crying because of the big changes in his life. Not only did he lose his father, but it now feels like his mother is a whole different person. Before she would always take the abuse. Now she's throwing away his books. Uh, before she would always like let Eddie get away with things and be a very indulgent mother. Han uh, Now he's angry enough at her that she would he would push her. So he's probably crying because he, he feels great changes in his life and he, it's hard for him to process. He has lost his father. He, he has kind of lost his mother and he's not sure anymore about what his life will become, what will happen in the future. But why is the main character crying? And I guess at this point we can say that the main character is a young girl, right? Because now perhaps we're married. Uh, okay, so the question is, was Mrs. Sawyer violent to Eddie? Yeah, I don't think we have evidence for that. It seems like she was too busy being a victim to really mistreat her children. She was trying so hard to survive her husband's treatment. Uh, I don't think she would have enough power in her family to mistreat Eddie because Eddie is also half white. So in the social uh, dynamics, he actually had more power than his mother. Yeah, I don't think we have evidence that she abused him. Yeah. Um, so we know why Eddie is crying, but why is the main character crying? Well, Remember that uh, she is 
stealing a book from Mrs. Sawyer's uh, burn pile only because Eddie takes one. So she feels like supporting her friend. She feels like, uh, you know, if you're friends, you have to take care of each other. You have to help each other. So why is she crying? Maybe simply because Eddie is crying. And from, from her reaction, we know that she doesn't know why she's crying. She says, when I felt my own tears on my hand, I thought now perhaps we're married. She doesn't think about the reasons that make her cry. She cries first. And then she thinks about it. So perhaps she's crying in support or in empathy. This is an interesting question. Does Mrs. Sawyer love Eddie, her son? It's hard to say. I think we can examine that question from the reverse angle. Does Eddie love his mother? I would say it's complicated because first he is angry at her for throwing away his dad's books. But then when the main character brings up the fact that his mother is black, he also gets angry and tries to defend her. So it's complicated. Like many relationships between parents and children, it's complicated. So does she love him? I would say it's complicated. Okay, and question five, are there some similarities between these two stories? Yes. First of all, they are all about young children. They are all told from the future. The person telling the story is the older version of the main character. They are all about a day when something bad happens. In Arabi, it's when the main character fails to buy something for his crush. In the day they burn the books, it's when the main character's friend finally realizes that his life will be completely different because his father has died. And then finally, both stories are about colonialism. In Arabi, it's about the colonial relationship between England and Ireland. In the day they burn the books, it's about the colonial relationship between England and the Caribbean islands. Um, of course, there are differences as well, right? In Arabi, the story is in the first person. The main character is the person who goes through these experiences. But in The Day They Burned the Books, the story is about the main character's friend. And the main character is simply looking at this situation and supporting her friend through this situation. OK, finally, question six. How can you tell that these were written in the 20th century? Let's take a look at that part of the handout. Uh, OK, so the way that Eddie feels about his parents after his father dies is also very psychoanalytical. Right? He's, his, his feelings are divided. He loves them and he hates them. Uh, we also have influences of modernism, the idea of uh, trying to seek a tradition. The main character of Araby loves old things, loves traditional things. He connects Mengen's sister to his religion, and his religion is also a very traditional historical religion. So it seems like for the main character of Araby, the idea of history and tradition is very important. And that connects with the modernist authors who were drawing on different Western myths and traditions from the Golden Bough to write their literature. Uh, of course, Joyce is a major character or major figure in modernism, but you can't say that on the final exam. Uh, Araby uses stream of consciousness. There are no quotation marks. 
there there is no like changing of angles. It's always one person telling you the whole story. And to a slightly lesser degree, the day they burn the books is also like that. It's told from one perspective, but it does say he said, she said, so it's technically not stream of consciousness. It's not coming directly from the narrator's mind. Ireland gained independence only in 1922. So when Araby was published, 1914, it was still a British colony. Uh, and then, of course, Irish literature. Uh, even though you can't say because Joyce was Irish, you can say the story is set in Dublin, Ireland, uh, and it reflects a concern and interest in Irish literature. Uh, and then the day they burned the books is also about. Um, it's also an example of post colonial literature, literature about the colonial experience that was written or published after independence. So it's like looking back on the old days when they used to be a colony. The story is full of like colonial racism and sexism. And it, you really are only able to write very clearly about these topics after they have ended. You also have a concern for immigration in the day they burn the books because Mr. Sawyer works for a travel agency. A steamship company. Uh, so of course, some people are there as tourists, but you also have people moving. Right when it was first describing Mr. Sawyer, it says he didn't do this, he didn't do that. Basically, all of the jobs that a British man might have in the Caribbean. So this also reflects immigration. Yeah, I think those are the main issues and main ideas from the 20th century that we can see in these two stories. Yeah, um, it might also be interesting to learn that Arabi is called Arabi. The market is an Arabic market because um, there was a fascination with Arabic culture at that time. Before this story, in the late 19th century, there was a new translation of the Thousand and One Nights, and that started a whole fashion for Arabic things. And also the Middle East is a traditional location for analysis regarding colonialism. So when when uh, like authors started writing about how colonialism and imperialism distorted and hurt their local culture, a lot of these people were from the Middle East, in fact, from Palestine. Uh, which brings up a very depressing mention of recent events in Palestine and Israel. Because we know that Israel is a country founded mostly, or not mostly, but in many respects by Jewish people from other places. Not There are, of course, Middle Eastern Jewish people. But for example, uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, USA. So thinking about Israel today also brings up these bad memories of colonization. OK, that's it for this week. Do you have questions? OK, before next week, please read. What am I asking you to read? Please be a poem, please be a poem. Oh, it's an essay. Cool. OK, please read this essay. On the abolition of the English department. So these three African writers are proposing. These are three English professors. Are proposing to abolish the English department in Kenya. Why? And could their reasoning 
have something to say for us in Taiwan.